Okay, so maybe we have fewer, fewer AV problems here. So um, if, you're, if you're like me, um, you have a mother. Um, and like, you know, mothers everywhere, she, she wants to know what you do for a living. And, um, and so, you know, one day I had this, this, I guess it's kind of hypothetical, but I've, I've had this conversation, um, of versions of it several times. You know, what do you do? Well, I write compilers. I do a lot of things, but yeah, compilers is one of the things I'm known for. Uh, what's a compiler? Oh, well, it's a program that, what's a program? Ooh. Okay. So, so, okay, so now explain what a program is. Okay, let me back up and say, what is a program? Well, we know what programs are. We're all programmers. Okay, we know what programs are, right? Uh, hello world. Okay, right. Or it's some machine code that, uh, you know, we're just looking at J and I bits and pieces. It, 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 it does something with some piles and piles of assembly. Maybe, you know, we widen the net a little bit. It's a recipe for getting something done. It's, you know, what it takes to bake a cake. It's a pile of instructions that I'm going to use to pay my taxes. Um, you know, in, in this talk, this context, a compiler is a recipe for, I'm sorry, a program is a recipe for getting something done. It's a set of instructions that I'm going to follow. And you're the cook? Well, not usually. Usually there's some machine. Um, and what do I mean by machine? Well, you know, in the first example, we all know it's a computer, right? It's your desktop or your whatever. Maybe it's an embedded device. Maybe it's in my pacemaker. No, I don't have one. Um, maybe it's in my cars, lots in cars, right? Um, maybe it is a person. Maybe it's the chef, and he's going to follow this recipe to do something. Maybe it's me, and I'm having to follow this tax form mile after mile after mile so, you know, I can give Donald Trump some money. Um, it's an actor, that follows instructions to change the physical world, right? It's, it's a doer, it's an activity. What's getting baked? Oh, okay, good question. Um, well, the answer is getting baked. What's the answer? Well, so, and so it's a very general idea here. The answer is well, hello world, or email, or it's a browser so I can look at these cat videos, or it's a database or some game I'm playing, or it's a phone call, and I don't mean the conversation or the ability to have a phone call. I mean, the active dynamic phone call with sound getting digitized over the internet and back out again. It's the action piece of it. Or the answer is, oh, the cake. Yeah, okay. Or, you know, it's Uncle Sam with my money. He's very happy and maybe I'm not quite so happy. Um, the, the, then this model of the world, there's a machine in the middle as the actor and he's going to take a set of instructions, a recipe for getting something done, and change the physical world and getting the answer I want out, right? The program, then, is defined by rules that we make up, and therefore it's easy to change, and we call that software. Whereas the machine is defined by the laws of physics, and it's hard to change, and we call it hardware. And the answer is just what we want out of the thing. So what's a compiler? Well, it's a program. And what's it used for? Let's talk about I.O. for a second here. I, I for input, right? So in my little model of the world here, the machine's going to take this pile of instructions and change the physical world and produce an answer for me. It's also going to take an input. Eh, OK. And in the first case here, the example, inputs might be things like files and keystrokes and mouse clicks. It might be physical reality, sound waves and radio waves that are, are part of the, the whole implement. The, the microphone is taking sound waves and getting some little signal out that's getting digitized and processed. And it might be flour for my cake, but it might be, it's also the position of the flour container because that dictates what that chef has to do to go use the flour in the first place. It's not just simply the flour is the obvious analog. And of course for me, it's everything the government wants to know about me. Am I married or not? Am I income and taxes I've already paid and whatever. So the input is the real time state of the physical world. It's not part of the program. It's not part of the machine. We write the program but the input is something we react to. And the output is? Well, it's just another answer. Programs can be outputs. Well, and inputs as well. So that brings me around to what a compiler is. What is a compiler? Compiler is a program that changes a program into another program. It's a pile of instructions that that machine is going to work on. It's going to take as an input, a file, 
with a pile of instructions and produce an output, which is another pile of instructions. How does that help? Well, not all programs are created equal. Programs follow rules, but often the rules do not mention time. Faster programs are usually better. Same program, same answer, but faster. Faster is good. Often the program changes languages. Computers only do machine code. So, you know, I have my C or my Java on the left, and my machine code on the right. The machine has to have the machine code, so the input program will, might change from Java or C here into machine code. And then my robot chef can do my cooking for me. So the cake, but faster? Yes. Seems complicated. Yes. Compile, then run. Two steps. GCC on the left takes a foo CC program, runs it through the machine, it produces an ADAT out, a pile of machine instructions, which are then run through the very same machine to read the inputs from the real world, produce the answer I'm really looking for. Two steps. Well, why not do it all at once? It used to be that way when we toggled machine code into memory and then hit the run button. Way back in the day, I, I did not do ENIAC here, but I did do machine code toggling into actual machines that I physically toggled the buttons for, and it was machine code I did, and I hit the run button. But it was too hard to write machine code, so we wrote simple English text for the code, like my cake.assembly here. And then we ran a compiler to make the actual code, and then we ran that, and we call it assembly. So we have an assembler on my left, takes my cake and assembly, produces a cake exe in machine code, which I can then run and actually get a cake out. So assembly is easier to write. Yeah, C is easier to write than assembly, and Java versus C, and so on. Instead of asteroid games, we're writing things like Google Maps or TensorFlow or YouTube videos of cats. What about faster programs? Yeah, what about faster programs? Compilers got slow to make the programs go faster. You want to do the compiler once and then do the faster program thereafter. And you mentioned doing it all at once. It's this old idea. It's been around forever and ever and ever. It keeps getting forgotten and remembered. Compilers don't have to be slow, but nobody paid attention because you only did that step once. If they're fast enough, you can combine the steps. Combine them? Yeah. So in my example here where I'm taking this you know, C compiler and my cake.cc, one step is to produce the machine code. And the next step is to actually run the machine code to get my cake. We can combine the steps. Seems obvious. And we call it just-in-time compilation. The JVM both runs the, um, runs the compiler and runs the rest of the program as well and takes as input the Java code as a class file and the real-world inputs builds the machine code, runs it, reads the real-world inputs to produce the answer we're looking for. It's compile, then run, all in one step. Wait a second. Where did the compiler come from? Well, we wrote them. But you need one, or, and, or else you write in machine code. And you said that's hard. And the answer is yes, it is hard. The first compilers were written the hard way, and they had to be simple. Later compilers could be written using the earlier ones. The programming community pulled itself up by its own bootstraps. This used to mean to, you know, to better oneself by one's own unaided efforts. It was definitely a monumental effort to get compilers to the state where they are now. And this is why we boot compilers? Yep. I mm. thought it was to kick the lazy bum awake. No. So later compilers are written with earlier compilers? Yes. There was some step one written a long time ago where some poor person whose name I found in the Wayback Machine um, wrote a compiler in machine code which reads assembly and writes machine code. It has to be written in machine code to run on the machine, but you want it to actually read a program in assembly. So in step two, the same person wrote a compiler in assembly which reads assembly and writes machine code. And the answer, of course, is a compiler that's in machine code which reads assembly and writes machine code, and that's assembler. The first one is hard to write because you write in machine code. And the second one's a lot easier. But the new compiler is the same as the old one. What was the point? Well, we have the easier to write one in assembly. And then what do you need the old one for? Turns out you don't. You can toss it. And then you can use the second one, the compiler in machine code, as your input program as well. 
So you now have a compiler and assembly, which reads assembly and writes machine code, and you have a compiler and machine code, which reads assembly and writes machine code. And one makes the other, and there's a closed cycle there, and we call this being self-hosted. We repeated that step a few times. So on the left, then, I have my assembler now. And on the top, I'm bringing in a compiler in assembly which reads C code, not assembly, and writes machine code again. And then I get out a C compiler. Because it's written in assembly, it's much easier to write than the one in machine code. And because it's easier to write, I can solve a harder problem. In particular, I can write a compiler that reads C code, a much harder language to write a compiler for than assembly. And we repeated this step a few times to get to C through some in-between steps I didn't mention here, including things like uh, uh, Bliss and Forth and Fortran and Algol. There's a bunch of in-between languages. So we're, we're actually headed for this compiler here, which is in C and reads C. And it produces as output a compiler in machine code, which reads C and writes machine code. And that is, oh, goodness, is it turtles all the way down? Well, no, mom, it what's not. There was the first one, but not anymore. Well, mostly people start from C or it's follow on C++. Many languages claim to be self-hosted, but few actually are. For instance, they rely on the GCC toolchain or LLVM or based on virtual machines such as Java or JavaScript, themselves based in C. Heavens, all those funny names. What's a virtual machine? Well, it's a real machine pretending to be another kind of machine. V for virtual, virtual machine. The real machine runs a program that has it mimic the virtual machine. And the virtual machine is one that's just too hard to build physically. That's why we're doing it virtually. So here I have a, a program that's a virtual machine program. And it's in machine code to run on the real machine. But it's going to read something that's not machine code. I'll call it bytecode here. And it's going to write out machine code inside the real machine. But if I go outside that box, the virtual machine looks like a real machine. It's going to run virtual machine code, bytecodes, and it's going to take real world inputs and put a real answer out. But under the hood, there's a mimic for the virtual machine that's running on the real machine. The Java virtual machine is a well-known example, but there are others. Browsers run JavaScript in much the same way. Pascal, I think, did, uh, uh, has a p-code machine that's very similar. Oh, I didn't realize there were other kinds of machines. Yeah, yeah, there are lots. Used to be lots more. Everyone's, you know, x86 now. But actually, there's still lots because most of your cell phones have all kinds of funny processors in them besides either an x86 or an ARM or one of a, a handful of those. And each one needs a compiler? Well, we use cross-compilers. A cross-compiler knows how to write many different kinds of machine code. So it takes as an input a program in some language you want and the kind of machine you're going to target. And the cross-compiler here, xcc, will run on a machine and read your cake at CC and produce out a bunch of machine code for machine number one. And you can run that on a machine number one and get a cake, or machine two, or machine three. And all the cakes are the same? Yes, by design, but only up to a point. We call it program semantics. The compilers try very hard to preserve the sameness where it is defined. Time is not part of the definition, so programs are allowed to be faster or slower and still be the same. And here I'm going to vary from my slides a little bit. And this represents, one of my, in my opinion, one of the greatest weaknesses of the current crop of programming languages on the planet. They don't refer to time directly. So faster or slower actually makes a difference, of course, because from the moment we're born to the moment we die, we have a finite amount of time on the planet. It's the most scarce resource imaginable. So time is actually the most important thing. The act of dropping time from programming languages was done to make the language mathematics simple and able to let us do the things we do with compilers right now, but it is not, it, it misses out on a fundamental truth of the universe. So I think there will come a time when we will put time back into the programming languages, and then we'll have hard real-time behaviors possible. Right now, everyone who does hard real-time has to work very hard because they only get so much help by the languages, and the rest of it, they do themselves. Do you ever make a mistake? What if a compiler has a bug? Yes, then things get complex. I should talk about the best compiler bug of all time, the Ken Thompson hack. Whoa, 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 slow down. OK, OK, let's look at a simple compiler bug and what's it do. Suppose I make a mistake while I'm trying to make fast machine code. So I have a C compiler on my left here, which is in machine code. It's going to read C and write machine code. I have the same compiler in source code in C and, and reading C. 
and I'm going to write out machine code. I want to write out better machine code, faster machine code, but I make a bug. So I then compile my compiler, and out comes a new compiler, which is like the old one, but it has a bug in it. I take the buggy compiler, and I run it to go, you know, try to go use it on my cake.cc program to get something done there. And instead of getting it out of a pile of machine code, it probably just crashes. But it could be that my bug is subtle, and I just make bad machine code out. When I run the cake exe on the flower, the instructions are bad, and the robot burns the cake. Right? There's some problem in the generated code. But your compiler is now buggy, and I'm using the compiler. I can't make a good new one because I'm using the compiler to make my compiler. So we have to roll back. We have to keep a good old copy. And then we can start with uh, the broken C code that has my bug in it, and hopefully fix it, and make faster code out. And when I compile it, I get a compiler in faster machine code, which will read C and write faster machine code. We'll call this an optimizing C compiler. And who was Ken Thompson? And what was this hack? Well, he was an early compiler writer, and he came up with this really cool hack. He said, suppose, suppose I have this you know, bug I wrote into the source code. And the bug is kind of special. It says, if I see that I'm compiling the root password checker, insert a secret backdoor so I can log into every Unix machine on the planet. And the output of compiling this is another compiler that looks for all the world like a C compiler. It does all the things you expect a C compiler to do, except that it has a bug in it that when it compiles the Unix source code, the password checker has the secret backdoor. And now I can break into any Unix machine on the planet. A giant security hole. OK, OK, but it's a bug, right? Just fix the compiler, and the problem goes away. I can look and see the source code. It's got a bug in it. Ah, not so fast. Ken's hack is more clever than that. I'm going to insert a second bug. The second bug says, if I see that I'm compiling myself, I'm going to insert both of these bugs. And now I get a compiler that has both of these bugs in it. No problem. It works the same as I did before when I run it on the Unix kernel. My compiler compiles Unix. I get out a root password checker and a backdoor that I can break into. I can self-host and take my compiler and run it on myself. And when I see that I'm compiling myself, I'll insert both of these bugs. Notice I didn't need the piece of bugs to say that. So I can self-host and throw away the old good compiler and fix the source code. And now the bugs only live on in the machine code, which is too hard to read for humans, miles and miles and miles of it. So when I compile myself, I get out a new compiler, which is the same as the old one. It's truly self-hosting, and it has these two bugs in it. The bug is only in the compiler. You can't see it in the source code at all. And you can repeat this for all the tools in the tool chain, debuggers, editors, kernels. No evidence will be found in the source code. The bug is only ever in the machine code. But when it reads itself, it pushes the bug back. When it reads your debugger, it pushes a buggy debugger that hides itself. Right? Really slick. There are other tricks you can do. For instance, 80s game emulators. Oh, oh not now. I've heard enough. Go write a compiler or save the world or some such. Yes, mom. I'm done. <laughs>